replied. Lord Randall has better ways to deal with broken men. Steel and hemp and rope. Sir, my lady, said Podrick, is a broken man an outlaw? More or less, Brian answered. Septon Merribald disagreed. More or less than more. There are many sorts of outlaws, just as there are many sorts of birds. A sandpiper and a sea eagle both have wings, but they're not the same. The singers love to sing of good men forced to go outside the law to fight some wicked lord. But most outlaws are more like this ravening hound than they are the lightning lord. They are evil men, driven by greed, soured by malice, despising the gods and caring only for themselves. Broken men are more deserving of our pity, though they may be just as dangerous. Almost all are common-born, simple folk, who had never been more than a mile from the house where they were born until the day some lord came round to take them off to war. Poorly shod and poorly clad, they marched away beneath his banners, oftentimes with no better arms than a sickle or a sharpened hoe or a maul they made themselves from lashing a stone to a stick with strips of hide. Brothers march with brothers, sons with fathers, friends with friends. They've heard the songs and stories, so they go off with eager hearts, dreaming of the wonders they will see, of the wealth and glory they will win. War seems a fine adventure, the greatest most of them will ever know. Then they get a taste of battle. For some, that one taste is enough to break them. Others go on for years until they lose count of all the battles they have fought in. But even a man who has survived a hundred fights can break in his hundred and first. Brothers watch their brothers die. Fathers lose their sons. Friends see their friends trying to hold their entails in after they've been gutted by an axe. They see the Lord who led them there cut down, and some other lord shouts that there is now. They take a wound, and when that's still half healed, they take another. There's never enough to eat. Their shoes fall to pieces from the marching. Their clothes are torn and rotting, and half of them are shitting in their breeches from drinking bad water. If they want new boots or a warmer cloak or maybe a rusted iron half helm, they need to take them from a corpse. Before long, they're stealing from the living, too, from the small folk whose lands they're fighting in, men very like the men they used to be. They slaughter their sheep and steal their chickens, and from there it's just a short step to carrying off their daughters, too. And one day they look around and realize all their friends and kin are gone, and they're fighting besides strangers beneath a banner that they hardly recognize. They don't know where they are, or how to get back home, and the Lord they're fighting for does not know their names. Yet here he comes, shouting for them to form up, to make a line with their spears and scythes and sharpened hoes to stand their ground. And the knights come down on them, faceless men, clad all in steel, and the iron thunder of their charge seems to fill the world. And the man breaks. He turns and runs, or crawls off afterward over the corpses of the slain, or steals away in the black of night, and he finds some place to hide. All thought of home is gone by then, and kings and lords and gods mean less to him than a haunch of spoiled meat that will let him live another day, or a skin of bad wine that might drown his fear for a few hours. The broken man lives from day to day, from meal to meal, more beast than man. Lady Brian is not wrong. In times like these, the traveler must beware of broken men and fear them. But he should pity them as well.